Um, but it was merely to say that we're undertaking this discussion of two topics, the um, geopolitics of privacy, privacy policy, of course, depending how you pronounce it, and uh, better regulation making. And it's the fruits of this engagement with a group of think tanks. And I was just at the point where I was saying, obviously, it's fun to do these discussions at any time, but at this really auspicious time for the European Union, where obviously our top roles are being are, are crystallizing and the work program is becoming clear, uh, it feels very appropriate that we publish the first of our papers this morning. So it's available at iia.com forward slash publications. And the second paper will be published at the same time in two weeks, on Wednesday, the 4th of December. And just to say very brief, sincere thanks again to Step, our gracious host, and it's just a, another excellent engagement with, with, with a peer think tank, a think tank that in many ways sets the trend for how uh, the rest of us try to operate. I'm just battling a bit of feedback here. I also want to thank our uh, think tank group. So in addition to SEPs, I'm delighted that we had engagement with the Klingendal Institute in the Netherlands, represented here in the room. Lovsek in Slovenia, represented here on the stage. Uh, PISM in Poland, also on the stage. The IIEA in Dublin, with myself and my colleague Seamus Allen here. And indeed, um, a number of think tanks that are, are not represented here, but who uh, contributed to the discussions with Think Tank Europa in Denmark, Alcano in Spain, and the Egmont Institute in Belgium. Um, I think that's everybody. Did I forget anybody, Seamus? Great. So it's been great fun interacting with this group. And um, it, it would be appropriate for me also just to give a word of sincere thanks to Apple, who are also here in the room and who have um, provided financial support for this exercise. And it's greatly appreciated because uh, without that support, we would not have been able to meet today, for example, for, for this meeting. So th the final two things for me to say, just a quick word on format before handing over to the actual experts. So you're first going to hear from Seamus Allen, Allen in a moment. Seamus is the digital policy researcher at my institute in Dublin. And he's going to speak across our two topics, firstly on geopolitics and then on improving regulation. And the format will be after Seamus's remarks. I'm going to invite each of the panelists on the stage to, um, to say anything they wish, either to respond to what Seamus said or thoughts they have on the, on the topic. And then we'll do it all over again. So we're going to do the first topic first, the second topic second. I think that makes sense. And of course, there'll be an opportunity for Q&A from the audience here. And it's just a quick health warning. If you see me fiddling with my phone, it's just because I'll be consulting those online to see if there are any questions coming in in that format. We'll aim to wrap up by 3.30 local time. And just to say, it's a cold day in Brussels, and there is going to be some hospitality afterwards as well, if you want to have a cup of tea or coffee to continue the discussion, which is obviously there's many of you have made such an effort to be here. It would be great to carry on the discussions with the panelists and with you afterwards. So before handing to you, Seamus, literally my last job, I'm going to start with Stefania at the end. If you could just say your, your name and your institution and any, anything that you want to say at this point, when you get back to you, Seamus, take off. Switch off first, the green light comes on. Does it work? Oh, it does now. <laughs> Um, so good afternoon, everybody. I'm Stefania Kolash from Polish Institute of International Affairs. I'm an analyst in Global Issues Program, but I'm dealing mostly with EU substantive law, international law and OEC cooperation. And in addition to this, I have quite a broad uh, experience from private sector as I uh, used to work as an in-house lawyer in some Polish SMEs, but also bigger uh, corporations. Thank you. I'm Scott Marcus. Uh, I'm an associate senior research fellow here at the SEPs, and I'm sort of your host uh, for today, and very happy to be that. Thank you very much for organizing all of this workshop so well. Um, uh, in addition, I'm a part-time full professor at the Center for Digital Society, European University Institute in Italy. Uh, I work with almost all aspects of digital policy, and for the things that we're talking about today, they're both topics that I've published on extensively. They're things that I'm passionate about. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to speak about them today. So my name is Dominika Haidu, and I'm leading the Center for Democracy and Resilience at Globsec. It is a think tank that focuses primarily on Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, my center, uh, Democracy and Resilience, um, as you could have guessed from, from the name, focuses primarily on building democratic resilience. And so my approach towards this topic is more from the perspective of security and, and, and how to protect the democracies. <laughs> 
Thank you so much. Um, I'm Seamus Allen. I'm from the Institute of International and European Affairs with Barry. Uh, and I'm delighted that you're all here today. Uh, do you want to hand over to you, Barry? Do you want to go straight into it? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to give a bit of an overview on the paper that was just published this morning that Barry mentioned. And uh, so the topic of this paper is the geopolitics of privacy policy. And I think it's really interesting that when we think about privacy, we often think about really personal information, information that is really individual to us. And yet this policy area has become the center of many international controversies to do with trade, geopolitics, and security. So in the paper, I look at some of this and I look at the implications of it. And in outlining the paper, I'll outline three main sections of the paper with you here today. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about the international data transfers. So this is when data is crossing borders. And this has huge economic significance and uncertainty about this can pose major disruption. And thousands of companies, not just in digital, but in many sectors, uh, depend on this. The second thing I'll talk about is the implications of all of this for privacy and for fundamental rights and Europe's policies internationally. And then thirdly, I'm going to talk a bit about Europe's place in the international data economy. So to start with on international data transfers, uh, there is very strict rules and there is very onerous rules when it comes to sending personal data from Europe to elsewhere in the world uh, in order to protect privacy. But what can make this easier is when the European Commission has a data adequacy decision that recognizes that another country actually has adequate levels of privacy protection to potentially facilitate free flows of personal data. Now, in the paper, I examine this quite a bit because even when it comes to the data adequacy decision framework, there is a lot of challenges involved. And uh, one of the most prominent examples of this is the EU-US agreements, which led to a framework for data flows that not just once, but twice went to courts in Europe that ruled that it was actually legally invalid because those participating couldn't guarantee to protect European personal data in the United States in line with Europe's privacy values due to US surveillance law and due to US surveillance practices. Now in the paper, there's a couple of features of this that I, I go into and I examine, and I'm just gonna mention two here today. Uh, so the first one is just how broad and blunt and binary this type of decision can be. So this invalidation affected thousands of companies and it can affect these companies regardless of whether or not they may have any, had any data accessed by US surveillance, regardless of whether they're compromised in any way. And of course, there's many different types of companies, services, personal data that can be involved. And currently the framework doesn't necessarily allow nuance for that. The second point I wanna bring attention to is that these judgments were based on the legal hypothetical risk, what potentially could happen, as opposed to say the likelihood or documented cases of detriment in a catalog. And the reason this is so relevant is because there is a debate about to what extent these geographic restrictions on sending data actually help to enhance privacy. Inside of the EU itself, we see some countries have surveillance programs, say in France, or there could be selective surveillance like in Germany. And in recent years, we've seen a number of scandals due to its spyware, to do with the use of Pegasus, for example, cases where opposition politicians or media have been surveilled, and controversies in countries like Greece and Hungary and Spain. And even at an EU level, you may be familiar with the EU's uh, proposal on CSA material. Uh, this proposal could lead to processing of private messages in order to detect child sexual abuse imagery, but what critics say could be a form of mass surveillance. And to look at all these examples, it mightn't always be immediately obvious that restricting data flows is actually protecting privacy or promoting and advancing privacy for somebody. And not only could this pose major risk of economic consequences, this can also interfere what, what a citizen may want to do in terms of exercising their fundamental rights. As a citizen increasingly use services and technologies in order to exercise information access, in order to use freedom of expression and to protect privacy itself. So they may wish to use the service or technology they think will protect their privacy, potentially protect it from their own government or that they may trust more than their own government. And the current framework where you take that decision away, because we have seen companies that have said they may have to stop offering services in Europe due to these various controversies. Going on to the next point about Europe's place in the world and promoting privacy. Although Europe likes to try to promote privacy, there is a number of areas where it potentially could do better and where the EU may have inadvertently harmed privacy. We see some examples where the EU has provided surveillance technologies to partner governments in the Sahel or in North Africa. We see some examples where sanctions or penalties against particular countries or particular companies 
may harm access to privacy protecting technologies, including for dissidents in countries such as Iran or Russia or Belarus. And more generally, there are cases where European governments or European companies do share data uh, with governments around the world, including non-democratic governments and including authoritarian governments. And sometimes there can be very legitimate reasons for doing so. But we've also seen some examples where this possibly isn't the case and should not have happened. On the final topic, Europe's place in the international data economy. So although the EU's data strategy recognises that international data flows will be indispensable for Europe's future economic competitiveness and therefore commits that Europe should promote free and fair international data flows. So far, the EU has only issued 15 adequacy decisions for other jurisdictions. And five of those jurisdictions are very small, effectively European dependencies or microstates. Some of the others are only partial and some of the other words that remain are the subject of ongoing controversy. Uh, in other words, there is more scope for Europe to potentially do more there. And there is a, quite a contrast that many other countries and organizations are beginning to promote data sharing to a greater degree, like the US-led Global Cross-Border Privacy Rules Forum. And there is therefore a risk that Europe could fall out of some of these arrangements or not be able to participate properly. So in the paper, there's a number of recommendations, and I'm only going to touch on three of them here before we go to the discussion. And first of all is that policymakers have scope to consider a nuancing of the framework when it comes to data flows and data adequacy, to take into account different types of risk, different type of companies. The second recommendation is that the EU could have a strategy that would provide guidelines for both governments and private sector when it comes to dealing with governments elsewhere in the world in relation to protecting privacy and making sure that they're not inadvertently hurting privacy and giving guidelines when they share data. And the third one to touch on is that the EU should find ways to promote data sharing without necessarily obliging other countries to imitate the GDPR or equivalent legislation. Uh, so a mechanism for this has already actually been used in the EU-US agreements, where companies can actually agree to a framework and say that they will follow Europe's rules for the process of European personal data, even when their own country may not have an equivalent law. And what this may require is that the European Commission, instead of having an adequacy decision, recognizes which jurisdictions don't pose legal obstacles that would make it impossible for a company to do this. And this would obviously have to be overseen by a rigorous European regulatory enforcement system. Uh, so I'm going to finish there and I'll hand over now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Seamus. What I'm going to propose doing, colleagues, is in 30 minutes or so, we'll be starting again on the second paper. I'm going to propose we start, if Dominica, if you have something to say, then Scott, then Stefania, and then we do the second round, we'll start from Stefania and work back. So, and remember those in the room here, if you have a question, please do raise your hand. I'll be looking at my phone in a second to see if there's questions. I haven't lost interest. But Dominica, would you like to say anything at this stage? You got the mic from Scott there. Over to Dominica from Dobsec. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Seamus, uh, and also congratulations on the paper. I think it raises a lot of different angles um, on, on on data protection and privacy policy um, that uh, I also haven't haven't seen before personally. Um, and uh, I might not agree with all of them one hundred percent, but I think that it makes uh, the the discussion even more 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 fruitful and interesting. Um, so I just um, would like to maybe follow up on the on the third recommendation that sort of brings us um, to a um, to a data governance where we uh, will be forced we will be forced probably to create this distinction between um, the um, jurisdictions or the states that we can trust um, and that have sufficient privacy policies in place. But then you also mentioned a, um, a specific case of um, citizens uh, living in countries where they do not actually trust the government. So we'll also have to have an approach where we rather are choosing companies uh, to, to, that we trust uh, to, to handle our data. So where I'm... Um, where I'm trying to uh, where I'm trying to go with that is that we will probably have to look at some sort of two tiered approach where we have jurisdictions, the governments where we um, that have sufficient data protections on some level, although not 100% copying GDPR. But then we also have different companies that we that have uh, sufficient terms and conditions and internal policies where we um, that are 
compliant on, on a certain level. And I think that we should nonetheless have strong red lines in this respect. So I think your paper to some extent mentions um, the fact that uh, or mentions the, the, the cooperation with, uh, with uh, autocracies as, as a potential risk and uh, mentions also that there nonetheless might be companies um, in, in these autocracies that might have uh, internal policies that, that uh, uh, might be on a paper in compliance with, 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 with the EU's regulations. But uh, I think that from the EU perspective, as we are still in, um, a community of democracies, we should have in terms of cooperation with autocracies, there should be a clear red line where um, we uh, should not allow the, the, the sharing of data with, with, um, the, with the private sector companies that are, that are based in the autocracies because, I mean, uh, of the lack of the rule of law in general. So um, I just want to make this uh, distinctions uh, for the introductory remarks. Thanks. And to you, Scott. Okay, thank you very much for those comments, Dominica. I think those were important. Okay, well, uh, for me, I'd like to, again, come back to the legal bits a bit here, if I might. So the main instrument for privacy in the European Union is the GDPR. It's easy for us to remember that GDPR as the global gold standard, the vanguard of the Brussels effect, the ability to lead by example the rest of the world. So this gold standard, well, gold is precious. That's easy to keep in mind. Easy to forget is that gold is also heavy. And what we see today uh, is that there are many calls for reform to GDPR, including from the MEP, who is perhaps its most important sponsor, Axel Voss, uh, there are a number of issues that are really obvious in the law, not adequately taken into effect, even though what it achieves is truly important and good. Um, the first is that in terms of its goals, it's really pretty limited. It gives only one, which is protection of consumer pr uh, privacy. Many other instruments provide multiple objectives. I think there are 10 in the European Electronic Communications Code. It means it's very hard really to balance across them. There is a recital in the act that talks about the need to recognize privacy as one of many fundamental rights and one of many different European directions. But you will look in vain, I think, for any operative text that implements that, which means that uh, the DPAs and also the courts tend to give uh, rather harsh judgments in many cases that I would argue are, are not as attentive to the principle of proportionality as they ought to be. Now, a second area that I think merits some thought is how GDPR relates in terms of relations among the member states, between the member states and the EU institutions, and coherence across different thematic areas. Different EU laws do this in different ways, no two are alike. In the case of GDPR, the mechanism across member states is demonstrably bad. Uh, the responsibility, the so-called one-stop shop, puts prime responsibility in the single member state where the, where the firm has its European headquarters. This means that the largest online platforms, the ones where the most complex questions have tended to be raised, uh, are all governed primarily from Ireland or Luxembourg. This creates two issues. One is an obvious misallocation of resource. The second is possible incentives problems because, of course, the, uh, the member state governments work very hard to get those headquarters. So there, there are issues here, and I think they're well understood issues. Most notably with GDPR, the impact on the European economy is pretty well documented. GDPR has been around long enough that there are empirical studies each of them gets slightly different results. Each of them focuses on slightly different things. But it's a pretty much across the board recognition that GDPR in an economic sense has done more harm than good. So there's a really strong argument to be made that this is a law that's ripe for, some, for a tune-up, that it's time to take another look at it. Again, what it achieves is important. Can it achieve what it seeks to achieve at lower cost? And this, I think, needs to get attention, particularly in the next term where we have such a strong focus on productivity as particularly motivated in the Draghi report. Now, coming back to the question of international data transfers, if I may, which is really a key focus of this very interesting report, 
So let's talk about those for just a second. The, uh, the key issue here relates to two CJEU, two high court decisions, uh, Schrems 1 and Schrems 2. And both of those place severe constraints or could place severe constraints on transfers of personal data to the United States. Important to bear in mind, these are not about commercial privacy in the normal sense. They have pretty much nothing to do with commercial privacy. They were entirely about excessive US government surveillance, primarily for national security purposes. Now, is that a good thing? In fact, I would argue it is great that somebody is pushing back against US surveillance. It happens that I am, or was for decades, the expert witness against the George W. Bush administration for their then illegal surveillance of tens of millions of Americans. Um, so it's good that somebody takes this up, but one also needs to recognize that if it leads to a total blockage of international transfers related to personal data, that would have substantial economic consequences, not just for the American firms, but also for the Europeans who use the, their, their products and services. So at the moment, we are in the happy position that we have an adequacy decision in place. Adequacy decision means US privacy rules are, are judged to be in broad balance as respectful to the privacy of Europeans as those in the EU. So that's good. We also have a new president of the United States. And we shouldn't forget that I believe his very first official act in his first term was to issue an executive order, later withdrawn, in which you had one very strange paragraph near the end, unrelated to the rest, that says, foreigners have no privacy rights in the United States, which is a position that's clearly antithetical with everything that the EU and the United States have negotiated in recent days. So we have the possibility that this whole issue will be reopened again. Now, I am reasonably certain that the US-based platforms would push back on this, I'm pretty sure they would feel that it's best to let sleeping dogs lie. We have a truce on this today. Um, but this is an issue that could very well get shaken up in the coming days or weeks. And uh, we should hope that it doesn't. And if anything does blow up, we should be alert and try to find pragmatic solutions because again, an interruption of these data flows of personal data transatlantic would be lose-lose for everyone. And with that, thank you, and I'll pass the floor. Thank you, Scott. Fania. Thank you. So um, maybe referring a little bit to what uh, my colleague uh, said, uh, let's focus on three different perspectives. So the first one would be this of an individual. So in many instances, you would have a choice whether you decide to uh, let your data be transferred abroad or not. So for example, it's a situation where you choose a service provider for some particular platforms or applications and so on. But there are many instances that actually you would be denied this choice. So if you decide, for example, to go to a third country that does not have uh, adequacy decision, not necessarily the uh, autocratic or uh, non-democratic regime, but just a state being kind of gray zone from the EU law perspective. So this brings me to the conclusion that actually you should think more globally about uh, sharing its standards, not necessarily exporting them, but uh, just to seek for some other venues to discuss what the standard should be to better protect its citizens, because sometimes we do lock ourselves in, in kind of EU jurisdictional bubble, where we presume to be safe and our data to be safe, but it's just only a part of the success because uh, many of us operate globally, either if we travel if, or we work. So um, we need to focus uh, more on what's going on um, in further areas. Uh, my second perspective would be that of uh, business. Um, so here again, um, EU is, uh, has set some, some standards, but uh, 
just as Scott said, uh, gold is heavy. So if you look from uh, the perspective of uh, SMEs, it's in many instances it's too heavy because what choice do you have? If you wish to be a GDPR compliant, uh, either you follow the rules very closely, it's time consuming, it's resources consuming, and it may lead you in many instances to the conclusion that you cannot really enter in a business with foreign partners because they do not have the same standards. And you are actually afraid of what may happen if somebody catches you because you are co-working or cooperating with somebody that has different standards. And take, for example, the US cooperation. So those standards are set, but those frameworks are changing because of judicial decisions, which is good, which is uh, protecting individuals. But on the other hand, you are not certain while entering the cooperation that's in five or 10 years uh, perspective, it will be still valid or even in a shorter perspective. And uh, third point, third perspective is this of EU. Uh, so I told before that we should focus on searching for different venue to discuss the possibility of externalization of um, EU data protection standards. So we have a lot of assets that we could share. For example, look at uh, language uh, variety of um, standards we already have and the templates we already have. It's translated to all official EU languages, which which actually provides foreign actors for a very useful set of documents and you do not really need to adjust that much or translate so it already cuts some cost but it again it's uh, from time to time especially for small businesses is just too much to handle because it's not just the one document to consult with it's a lot of templates uh, it's uh, very vague and uh, too complex for some very basic operations, because in some sectors, you first and foremost, you do not share sensitive data. And even if you share some personal data, usually it would be just an email. For example, you imagine you are a graphic designer. So you basically want to just have your name on painting you painted. And yeah, I, I'm referring to this because that was the branch of business I was uh, working for for several years, but uh, there was some kind of this problem. Uh, so my point would be just to, to see how those uh, gold standards and uh, to what extent should be externalized. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefania, Scott and Dominica. It's such a it's such a pleasure to get these different perspectives from 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 different parts of Europe. Um, it's just to to acknowledge that it's so it's been such a rewarding activity meeting with you in advance of this this project. I have things I could discuss here, uh, but I get to talk to this group a lot at our meetings throughout the year, which contributed to these papers. So uh, I'm keen to to privilege those of you who are here in in the room or anybody online if you'd like to ask a question or indeed make a short statement. I'll just acknowledge Alexandra here as well, of course, from Klingendal, who's just in the in the second row here, who also contributed to these discussions uh, throughout the year. Would anybody like to ask a question or say anything? We have one question at the back. How are we for microphones, Andrea? Do you want to take this one? Yeah. Yep. Actually, you might take Seamus as one of us, right? Sorry, Seamus. <laughs> and, and if it would be okay, just uh, a short one-line introduction to yourself, if that's possible. We're in business. Now it's working. So um, I just wanted to ask a question about your third proposal, Seamus, and whether you think it would stand up in the European Court of Justice and why. And just your name. You nearly gave us your I, name. I did give my name, yeah. but you couldn't hear it because the microphone is. <laughs> it's Megan Richards. Thanks, Megan. Seamus, speaking to this for now. Uh, you... Thank you. Uh, you yeah, know, that's a, a good question. Um, and so my, my third recommendation, this is specifically about allowing companies to agree to follow Europe's privacy rules, even though their own country may not have an equivalent privacy law. Is that the right one? Yeah. So this is drawing on the mechanism that is actually already in place in the EU-US data transfer framework. And that was in place in the two previous ones that were invalidated. 
and each time they were invalidated because of US surveillance practices, as opposed to the absence of US federal privacy law. And that's why I think there, there is room that the overall agreement can be valid, even when the countries, I think Scott wants to come in next. Uh, so I, I, I think it would be possible for it to be, to be deemed valid by the courts, if done correctly and done properly. And a key thing would be to have a sufficiently robust enforcement mechanism in place. Good. Well, if I can add a few words, uh, I, I think that what Megan was uh, was driving at, and by the way, Megan has had a distinguished career with the uh, with the commission. Um, I think her point was that the agreements between the companies alone would not be sufficient to permit transfer of personal data. If you look closely at the Schrems II ruling, the point that they made was that these SCCs, these contractual arrangements, were per se valid but they weren't binding on the government in, in the, for the country in which the firm resides. And therefore, there would need to be some separate process to confirm that, uh, that government surveillance practices were not overreaching. And um, this, historically, the only thing that we have that really does that properly today is the adequacy decision, which we today have in, in place. Uh, thank yeah, thank you for that clarification. No, that that's a very good point. And in the paper, what I actually specifically recommend is something that's equivalent, but almost equivalent, but almost the opposite to an adequacy decision, where the European Commission would actually issue a decision recognizing what I'm calling an absence of incompatibility. That means the Commission would actually recognize which countries don't make it legally impossible for companies to follow Europe's privacy rules for European data if they choose to do so. So, for example, a mass surveillance law or a mandatory data sharing law that's excessively broad, the Commission wouldn't issue those types of decisions for those countries. So the Commission would still need to filter out countries, but there would be a significant change in that it would no longer require countries themselves to have something equivalent to the GDPR. Okay, I'm still trying to channel what I think Megan was trying to say, but I think the issue would be, given that the Commission is currently the party that initiates the adequacy decision process, but it also goes through additional steps, including, I think, through the Parliament. Uh, there's a real question as to whether the, whether the courts would permit a procedure that was almost equivalent, but much lighter. As an, uh, the, it's doubtful they would take that as an equivalent. Is there another working mic down that end of the table somewhere? Is there just that one? Too. Fantastic. Uh, you have the mic, Stefania. Do you want to respond to this? No, no, no obligation, but just to invite you. Maybe I would just say that I would search for some other options to, to find a middle ground. So not necessarily uh, the decisions about the absence of incompatibility, though it's very tempting, but I'm just again afraid from the business perspective of, uh, well, operating in gray zones gives you a lot of possibilities, but I guess that at the end of the day, um, many of business um, people would not be really uh, eager to take that risk. Mm -hmm. um, especially in the light of what you said about uh, um, the court and uh, possibility of, um, let's say, negation of or annulment of uh, uh, those practices. But uh, how about, for example, creating a special economic zones with special uh, jurisdiction applicable? It's already done in uh, at least two cases. Those are uh, Arab states. So one such zone is created in Dubai. The other is, uh, I think, in whole, uh, in business di district of uh, Qatar, um, Doha probably. So maybe that's the solution to to be better covered. Thanks, Stefania. Veneka, do you have anything you'd like to say? Go back to the room. Is there anybody else who would like to come in? The gentleman here, I think a mic is coming to you. Do you, Andrea? Again, just a short affiliation, then a question or statement. Yeah, my name is... I think I'm on. Yeah, my name is uh, Neil Irvin, PhD student at uh, ULB here in Brussels. My question is, um, we're taking kind of a judicial approach here to privacy. My question is, to what extent do the does the European position reflect citizen expectations of privacy. So from the, from the perspective of an, of an individual. And so, for example, um, I think kind of there's, there's an understanding in the US, people relatively freely kind of give away their information 
and participate in, in platforms like Facebook and so on and and don't kind of think twice and, and the idea is that they appreciate the product that's in front of them so much that there's not really any qualm about what they're providing in terms of information. And then there's an the idea that Europeans maybe are more hesitant to give the information, but um, but that's the question is, are we kind of reflecting what people expect out of the products and services in their lives? Thanks very much, Neil. Did you forget your first name? What was your first name again? Neil. Neil, yeah. Is that directed at anyone specific or for the whole panel to... Okay, Seamus, why don't you kick off? The mic is there between yourself and Dominic. I'm going to be autocratic and hang on to this because I need it. Uh, thank you. You know, it's a, a good question. Oh, and back a bit, Mike. Uh, uh, it's a good question and an interesting one. And I think citizens have very, very diverse expectations when it comes to privacy. Uh, when I talk to people, there's plenty of people who don't really get that worked up about the fact that they're consenting to all these notices, that they don't necessarily know what's happening to the data. Uh, then, of course, there are citizens who want Europe to do more and they want governments to do more when it comes to privacy protection. And it does bother them the fact they're always consenting to notices. And when it comes to differences in public opinion, uh, there is polls suggesting that, say, in the States and other countries, people actually want stronger privacy protections than what's currently in place. Having said that, I do think there is areas where Europe's current privacy framework possibly does things that may not be expected by citizens and doesn't necessarily address some of the problems citizens may want to be addressed. Uh, so something we may talk more about later is uh, GDPR. And when it's being created, there was an expectation it would help put people in control of their online data. Whereas in reality, we see people are still consenting to things online, still handing over data, and don't necessarily feel in control of it. Thank you. I think I sensed the flurry of activity from your question, Neil. So we'll start with Dominica. Do you have a remark? Scott first, then Dominica. Cool. Back to you, Scott. Well, just a quick word. Um, I spend a lot of my time working as an economist, and of course, the natural thing one wants to do is say, how do people value these things? Um, and I don't have very experimental economists, but a Christie uh, would argue that even though people in surveys say we want more privacy, uh, if we use experimental economics to try to say how do they actually economically value it, it's pretty low in practice. I, I suspect that for a lot of Europeans, what they see is the inconvenience of having to constantly answer cooking messages and such. And the privacy gains are just less obvious. I think one of the uh... I think one of the key gaps that that we have in relation to 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 the problem that you've raised is also the lack of awareness. Some of the governments are also maybe uh, less uh, key on raising awareness about data privacy because of the controversies that you've raised. Because uh, they actually might be uh, more inclined to use the data for for uh, for surveillance or or, or um, yeah other um, misuse of of the personal data uh, and actually we have been seeing private companies sometimes doing uh, more awareness raising than the government or educational programs within within the member states. Um, and um, so I think this is one of the issues. The other issue is that um, um, I don't know whether there has been any Eurobarometer done on, on the perceptions of, uh, of the privacy or, or, or GDPR. I'm not sure of that, but um, I just, uh, uh, when I was preparing for the, for the panel, I found um, a uh, survey that has been done by Bitkom, uh, which is a German association uh, of uh, representing more than 2,000 companies in the digital economy. And you could see there that actually the majority of the, of the uh, enterprises said that GDPR, from their perspective, uh, makes business processes more complicated. 50% said that it, hamp it uh, hampers innovation, that makes it, it makes innovation more difficult. But at the same time, 56, sorry, no, around 60% uh, said that um, they are actually happy with having GDPR as any sort of, some sort of guidelines for data protection and they feel that their data is more protected in general. So I think that it's just plays nicely into the conversations that we're having that we, I think, generally agree that data protection is necessary and privacy is one of the core values that 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 is important for the European uh, space. But at the same time, we have these gaps, including awareness raising and education, which I think we should be focusing more at. Stefania, no, no pressure. Would you like to add anything to Neil's question? 
I don't think so. Cool. Uh, I'm going to uh, do something unusual here, Scott. I got a remark from online. So Brian Daly, who's watching in from Dublin, was curious to know what you said, but unfortunately we didn't have the mic on. Could you just do the quick summary of what your remark was before Domenica? Uh, which remark? I just a moment many. ago in response to Neil's uh, in response ah, to the question. Ah, okay, very the good. The abbreviated version, please. Uh, so maybe the mic didn't pick up. Yes. Uh, That's the problem, yeah. Okay, got it. Uh, okay, yes. What I had said was, that um, there's a fair bit of economics analysis. Uh, uh, Aquisti is particularly known for this, uh, where if you use experimental economics to try to say, how do people value consumer privacy? Most of them will say they want it, but the experimental economics say they ascribe a quite low value to it. In other words, they're not willing to pay for it. Yeah. And that implies that they don't think there's that much value to it. It may imply that. Um, my suspicion has been right along. People see the costs of having to constantly answer cookie messages and such, but the gains from privacy are not something that they directly see. Thank you very much, Scott. We're coming up on half time. Um, I think, okay, we have a final question here before moving on. Uh, if the, if, is the mic out in the, in the wild somewhere? Might just report to this gentleman here in the, in the far corner. Yeah, and if you just introduce yourself briefly, please. Hello, I'm Hikaru from Kansai University, uh, Japan. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, discussion. I have a question mainly to uh, Seamus. So could you explain why you use that term uh, geopolitics of digital privacy? The, the discussion has focused on data protection, uh, economics, uh, economic harms on companies, but I couldn't get why you, you call it geopolitics. So could you elaborate, please? <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, thank you. Um, so privacy is a is a very big topic, and this paper was specifically not focused on privacy policy in Europe and reforming privacy policy in Europe, but it was specifically looking at the international implications of privacy policy. So how privacy policy affects EU's engagement with other countries in the world, the flow of data between the EU and other jurisdictions. So specifically looking just at the international dimensions, as opposed to looking at domestic debates about how effective GDPR is, should we reform it, and so on. We are at time, but just if, if anybody feels the need to add anything to that from the panel. Awesome. Okay, there'll be a chance to chat over sandwiches later, as I say. So look, we're, we're at half time. Well done, everybody. I do acknowledge a question coming in here. Um, I'll just read it out quickly. It's from, from Siobhan. It's often only when data protection rights are abused or circumvented that a citizen realizes how important the legal fundamental right of data protection is. So I guess that's just a... A fair comment across the discussion of the, of the first panel. I'll just say now that uh, those online have the, the privilege of seeing the paper uh, in the digital flesh because I've shared it in the chat there. The paper as published covers the topics discussed, but arranges across a wide range of other topics, including surveillance and competitiveness and other interesting um, matters pertaining to this discussion. And I uh, uh, encourage you all to take a look at it at, at the first paper available at our website, iia.com forward slash publications. Without further ado, I think beautifully on time, um, I would ask you, Seamus, if you might just bring us through in a similar fashion, improving regulation, making insights from digital policy, which is the subject of our second paper, which will be published two weeks from today on the 4th of December. We're going to follow a similar format with this, with the only difference that we'll start with you, Stefania, for your, for your response, if you have one, then Scott, then Dominica, and then we'll go again to the physical and virtual floor for questions or comments. So, James, take it away. Uh, yeah. So this forthcoming paper, as Barry mentioned, the topic is improving regulation making, drawing insights from digital policy. Uh, so this is a very different topic. Now, better regulation and improving regulation making, it's not a new subject. It's become particularly prominent in recent years, particularly with the new burden of regulation. And in the paper, I'm drawing insights specifically from digital and digitalization. But of course, a lot of this is relevant to, to all other policy areas as well. So there's three sections in the paper that I'll outline here today. And first of all, I'm going to touch very briefly just on some aspects to do with the processes. And then secondly, I'm going to talk about improving regulation making with regards to the economic consequences. And then thirdly, with regards to the social consequences of regulations. So to very briefly touch, first of all, on the processes, something that's of interest to me and that I looked into is when it comes to impact assessments and public consultations uh, done by the Commission when preparing regulations 
there is potentially more room for these assessments to be more proactive and more probing in looking for problems, in looking for unintended consequences, and in looking for alternative solutions uh, than is currently the case. And often when these are being created, there can be an already pre-selected or preferred option in mind. And sometimes the impact assessment or the consultation is very much orientated that way. S a second point on consultations is it, it's been well documented that these can often be very unrepresentative. Often only those directly affected by a regulation will respond to a public consultation. And in the consultation process, some voices can be overrepresented compared to others, such as bigger companies with more resources compared to SMEs or NGOs, for example. Going on to the, the second topic I want to talk about, improving regulation making when it comes to economic consequences. Uh, so this is a particular focus of the Commission in, in recent years, and there is a promise of a new SME and competitiveness check. But looking at what the Commission is currently assessing when it comes to economic consequences in the better regulation toolbox, the better regulation guidelines, and looking at impact assessments on specific legislation, there is quite a narrow view on what competitiveness actually is. Uh, so first of all, there tends to be a disproportionate focus on administrative costs. Uh, but secondly, even more broadly, the focus tends to be on directly imposed business compliance costs or on price competitiveness. So the current competitiveness check of the European Commission is mostly allocated to looking at the effects on direct business costs or on price competitiveness. And of course, there's a whole range of other factors uh, relevant to the competitiveness of a product or a service that can be affected by regulation. This could be everything from how a product tastes, to the convenience of using it, to its durability, or to its security. Or it could be to do with business practices. So the GDBR and the DSA impact assessments focus very heavily on administrative costs. And they don't look at much at the broader business implications. Like, how does this affect the user experience? What can a business have previously provided that they no longer can? And there's an interesting, very specific example in the DSA impact assessment that I might share where it looks at a provision to do with recommender systems and a choice of profiling for users. And it says, here's the technical cost, here's the administrative cost, but it doesn't actually say, well, what's the business implication of this? How does this affect the user experience? Does it make the service more or less attractive? And on that note as well, it's worth bearing in mind that actually the direct business costs and the economic implications aren't always necessarily the same thing. So in the DSA as well, there's also a provision about making it easier or making sure that it's not unduly difficult to unsubscribe from services. And although all the businesses directly affected by this will experience this as a cost, and some of them may suffer the broader implication that they actually lose consumers as a result, this is arguably a measure that could be beneficial economically and beneficial for Europe's competitiveness. On that note, we also see some regulations designed specifically uh, particularly in digital policy, to promote innovation or to promote growth, like the Data Act, like the Data Governance Act, or the Digital Markets Act. Uh, so we do tend to think of regulation as being an economic burden, which it can be, and we should definitely bear that in mind. But there is opportunities for it to promote growth as well. And on to my third topic, on the social consequences of regulation. We often think of regulation as imposing an economic cost in order to achieve a social benefit. Uh, but sometimes regulations, especially in very complex areas, have to manage social trade-offs. And this is potentially an area where regulation making uh, could do better in particular. Uh, so for example, when it comes to digital policy, we are regulating technologies that citizens are using to exercise fundamental rights and that can have implications for democracy, for social resilience, and for security. And in the impact assessments on some major pieces of digital legislation with social implications like the GDPR or like the DSA, there isn't necessarily enough being done to proactively find these social trade-offs so that we can manage them more effectively. And social trade-offs are likely to be inevitable. Uh, so I'll give just a few examples here. So the GDPR, it's been noted, has come into tension with measures that are designed to counter money laundering, for example, anti-corruption initiatives. In some cases, the GDPR has been used as a censorship tool, uh, including the use of the right to be forgotten or against the media. In other cases, GDPR provisions on sensitive data have made it more difficult to collect data that is of benefit to minority groups. And something that may have been mentioned earlier in, in the GDPR impact assessment, there was an intention to address the situation where online users felt they didn't control their data. And rather than addressing that problem, it's possible that the GDPR has actually made it even worse 
on some other pieces of legislation, the DSA. One of the goals of the DSA is to counter the dissemination of illegal content, but it doesn't really set safeguards on what could be deemed to be illegal content. And in a variety of European countries, there's lots of laws, some of which may seem very extreme to other countries, or which could be anti-democratic or a threat to fundamental rights. And the DSA doesn't really set safeguards on what you can do to allow for that. A second point on the DSA is one of the goals of the DSA was to rein in discretionary censorship by online platforms. Uh, but again, the DSA doesn't necessarily achieve this because although you can contest against a platform, if it wrongly removes your content on the basis of its terms and conditions, the DSA doesn't really set strong limits restricting a platform from just changing its terms and conditions and doesn't allow you to directly contest about what they may be. And the DSA provision on the duty of online platforms to recognize information that may have negative effects on civic discourse may actually make that problem more complicated too. To briefly mention two other examples, the Cyber Resilience Act has caused quite a, a bit of debate because of provisions in it that would require mandatory disclosure of vulnerabilities that haven't been mitigated on digital products and so a to public authorities. And so a variety of, of stakeholders have criticized this and it said this, the dissemination of this information itself imposed some cyber security risks if these agencies are hacked or infiltrated or compromised in some way. And in the European Media Freedom Act, there's two particular features of interest. One is that European Media Freedom Act addresses spyware, and it addresses surveillance generally to protect journalistic sources, but it doesn't counter other forms of digital surveillance aside from protecting journalistic sources. And we see that this is actually increasingly used to surveil the media. There is also the media privilege provision in the European Media Freedom Act, which again is intended to benefit democracy by protecting the media. But there is a couple of problems with it. And just to give one, there's a problem when media gets captured, whether it's by governments that are undermining democracy or whether it's by vested business interests, that this provision could actually be harmful by giving these entities protection that isn't given to those who criticize or challenge them. And of course, when regulations interact, we can see lots of complexities. So many have noted a tension or a possible tension between the GDPR and the AI Act when it comes to preventing discrimination using data that's sufficiently broad and diverse, while at the same time, the GDPR may require you to minimize that data. So I'm going to go on to the recommendations. And there's quite a number of the paper, but I'll just mention a few here. First of all, on the consultations, uh, it, you know, it's well known that they can often be unrepresentative. So I do recommend that the commission could have some kind of affirmative consultation strategy for actively trying to engage stakeholders that are currently underrepresented. A second, is that when it comes to the impact assessments and the designing of regulations, that there should be a designated, or what I'm calling an adversarial critic, somebody who's specifically tasked with looking for problems, looking for unintended consequences, somebody who hasn't been involved in designing the regulation and impact assessment to proactively call out what could go wrong with it. On the economic side, as I've mentioned, I mentioned some of the shortcomings in the current understanding of competitiveness, and I propose a, a broader one should be used that focuses on many other factors rather than just costs and price competitiveness. And another recommendation is the stress testing of regulation. So this is we test regulation to see, will it actually achieve the goal that it's set out to do? Can something go wrong, wrong with the regulation? Is there provisions in it that could be misused? We ask a variety of questions, proactively looking for problems, looking for negative consequences. And in association with that, in the same way that a better regulation toolbox has checks for competitiveness, checks for SMEs. I would propose that there should be a check for democracy, for possible negative implications that could arise from regulation, and check for social resilience. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Seamus. So sticking to format, we're going to the end of the, of the, of the stage there. I'll start with you, Stefania, for your remarks and work our way back towards Seamus. Uh, yes, I have some brief remarks uh, regarding the consultations and then on uh, your second recommendation. Uh, so as far as the procedure of consultations is concerned, I do not necessarily see the problem that it's uh, not um, very representative in a sense that only strong views are represented and those who are more moderate are not. I mean, if somebody is interested enough in the topic to um, argument for or against uh, some solutions, uh, 
uh, I think it's enough to present valuable arguments. Otherwise, if we uh, focus more on quantity than on quality, it may get a little bit uh, chaotic and uh, prolong the procedure as well as increase uh, cost in terms of work and uh, time of preparing some initiatives. Uh, also regarding um, uh, the idea that um, commission advocates for some predefined solutions. I think that they are uh, making such a broad um, exercise before they prepare um, an initiative that they look for particular uh, options and they pick the best according to their needs and the policy. So maybe um, it's not worth to changing that much on this level, but rather to gain considerable uh, for, for and against arguments uh, for these particular options. Um, in my opinion, the challenge is that, that actually we do the consultations on the very beginning of the legislative process. And as we all know, it, then the proposal is uh, actually um, negotiated uh, by the council, by the parliament, and member states also have different views. Uh, then you have lobby groups, etc. So um, it's rather question uh, how to ensure that those views that were presented uh, on the very first level of uh, launching a proposal will be still retained by the end of the process. And uh, switching now to the recommendation part, so the recommendation to uh, so the special post uh, personal group of persons that would actually uh, make a stress test to the initiatives. I think that it would be worth uh, having in throughout the whole procedure. So again, coming back to this argument with consultations. So that's only initial stage. And after months of negotiations, uh, we would have completely different text of a legislative act or any other act. So it's worth to check in it against any possible um, loopholes or threats or any other challenges throughout the whole procedure, or at least at the very end when we have the final text, just to double check whether it's uh, correct and uh, future proof, kind of. Thank Thanks you. very much, Stefania. Scott, would you like to come in? Sure. Well, actually, first I'll add a few words to what was just said, because it's uh, closely linked to some of the things I wanted to point out. Um, in terms of the process, indeed, the, uh, the structure is the commission makes the legislative proposal and they submit the impact assessment with that legislative proposal. Now, there is an interinstitutional agreement that was created in 2016. Actually, one of the instructions of Dombrovskis is to update that. In that, commission, parliament, and council are all supposed to play a role. But the reality is council is pretty much asleep at the switch and parliament isn't doing enough. Uh, what this means is you get an impact assessment that makes some estimates at the outset about the costs and benefits of a proposed regulation, but nobody looks at it very much after that. Uh, within the parliament, there is a unit that takes a look at these impact assessments, and what they write, it's sort of like a five-page high school book report assessing the degree to which the impact assessment and the proposal assessing the degree to which it's consistent with itself. Uh, the ones that I've read don't contain any external evidence or any serious criticism. So what's really needed here is a much more open and, and serious process to try to get some, some real critique in. And I know, in fact, that um, Seamus is, is very interested in this idea of having red teaming uh, which I think is a promising idea, particularly if the red team is outside of the commission and truly independent. So uh, this is quite important. Now, uh, looping back to some of the points I'd wanted to make, um, as far as European regulation and the burden associated with it, there are many, many measures that say that the stakeholders are worried about growing regulatory burden. Now, that firms say regulation is a burden, at one level, that's not surprising. In this case, they're right. Uh, 
and they're right for a number of objectively, uh, objectively, objective measures. Uh, if you simply look at the size of the European aki, the collective size of the of European law, uh, it has grown tremendously. Some estimates are that it's doubled in the time since the uh, 10 member states entered in 2004, meaning that any new member state looking to exceed has a far greater burden. Uh, I've done the numbers, and it turns out that we're adding about 400 legislative acts per five-year term, and the number per term itself is going up by about 15% per term in every term except for the transition from Barroso to, to Juncker. He really made an, a conscious attempt to reduce regulation, and there's actually some results from that. But overall, it's a rapidly growing pace. Now, I published, together with a, a very good MEP staffer, Kai Zenner, who many of you will know, uh, and also with one of my Bruegel colleagues, Kamil Sekut, we publish a directory of all digital legislation and I can tell you that in that directory, as of 2011, there were 20 measures enacted. And as of today, it's 88. If you look at a cumulative graph, it's a very nice ski slope. So if we're seeing survey results that say that people are worried about the growing, value, uh, growing volume of things that they have to comply with, there's a basis for those complaints. I should add, there have been very few repeals over that time. And also, not a lot of the kind of work that really needs to be done, the refit process, to look at these things and say, what is working, what's not. Now, when we talk about the better regulation process, it's important to distinguish three main phases. And the, 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 the nice work that, that, uh, that uh, Seamus has been doing here focuses mainly on the first of these. So one piece is the ex ante or in advance impact assessment. What's the law likely to do? The second is evaluation after the fact, once the law has been in effect long enough that you can actually see what the results have been. The third is just kind of a overall maintenance of the legislative stock, pruning back things that are no longer needed. So all three are needed. Uh, the impact assessment has its problems. I would argue that it's the least problematic of the three. Impact assessment benefits from the fact that there has been a regulatory scrutiny board added. It's not perfect, but it does something. Uh, and you've got a good 10, 20 years of progressive refinement of the process. You know, even so, there are problems. One is, uh, one of my Bruegel colleagues actually did some research. There's still a substantial number of legislative measures, including some of the most controversial, that don't get an impact assessment. Now, that could be the case where Urgency was the case, but uh, she concluded that something like 10, 15% shouldn't have been raced through without an impact assessment. And actually one idea that, uh, that my colleague here at SEPS, Andre Renda, has put forward that I like is if something does go through on a basis of urgency, then there should be at least an abbreviated impact assessment done a few months later to say, well, what should have been looked at, what might have been missed. Okay, so those are issues on the impact assessment. But the more fundamental one is the one that I've already flagged. The impact assessment is done once as the thing goes in. Now, think about cost assessment. Cost assessment is a difficult task for a law that's not yet in place. It's really con very conjectural. But at least it's done once. As these things work their way through the sausage mill, what comes out of the sausage factory looks very different from what went in. And the impact assessment is never revisited. So even if the impact assessment had gotten the costs right in the first place, which one can doubt, the likelihood that they're correct at the end is pretty low. And part of the reason for that, too, is a political economy issue, which is parliament, council, they score their points with their voters by adding features that they think the voters will like but there's really very little pressure on them at that point to worry about the costs. So it's natural that the legislative measures, as they get through parliament, as they go through council, as they go through the trialogue process, they tend to get larded up. And there's no measure of this. Now, one place this really shows up is in the third phase, the part I talked about with trying to prune back the unnecessary, keep this, the legislative aki clean. 
the commission introduced something called one in, one out. That doesn't mean one measure gets repealed for each new one that's enacted. It means for each measure that has new burden on the firms, some equivalent burden should be reduced, hopefully in the same sector, if not, then somewhere else. It's a good idea, but the implementation is deeply, deeply flawed. What they're actually trying to reduce is solely administrative cost of the measure as proposed. Administrative cost for many of these measures is tiny compared with the operational costs and the transitional costs. And as I've just said, if the cost is known at all, they're looking only at the cost of the legislation as proposed because they can't look at the cost of the measure as enacted because nobody's uh, done a calculation on it. So uh, it means that we're really talking about optimizing a science fiction number. There was a report put out this year that said, ah, we saved $7 billion. That's nice. I mean, in macroeconomic terms, it's peanuts. But I, I think it really is a number that has very little to do with the wishes of European consumers. Okay, now on the evaluation side, so that was largely about impact assessment ex ante. Evaluation ex post, if you simply look at the number of evaluations done, compare it to the number of impact assessments, it's substantially less. I don't think anybody has done the hard work to compare them, but I believe far fewer evaluations are done than ought to be done. And I say that as a problem. With the impact assessment, if it's not done, Parliament and Council will notice. With the evaluation, if it's done badly or not at all, hardly anybody notices. It does go to the, to the RSB, the Regulatory Scrutiny Board. They don't do anything because it's too late. So we have a fundamental problem with evaluations not done as well as they need to be. When better regulation works right, it should be done on the principle of evaluate first. You should know what's wrong with an existing program before you try to propose amendments, fixes. We're in, I would say, rather weak shape. But the fu fundamental problem here really is who's doing the evaluations? It's the commission. It's the commission. In high school, in college, we don't let students grade their own homework. I've argued it should be handed off to the court of auditors, which has the independence to do it correctly, that could only work if they're also given resources and staff. But I think that's where it belongs, or something like that. Clearly, it can't rest where it is. We won't, we will continue to have flawed process. Um, I could say more about some of the things that ought to be working to achieve regulatory simplification, but maybe in the interest of time, I should hand off. Okay, there will be time at the end to come back as well, Scott. But just like any, just before inviting you in, Dominica, like any good research activity, it, it ideally identifies the ground you should, you should jump on next. And just of all the things you've discussed together, Scott, I've heard this from Scott before about the uh, the absence uh, of, of, of evaluations or the kind of uh, the underemphasis on, on, on evaluations within the, these processes. And I think it may be something worthy of SEPs or other think tanks to, to pay attention to in the future, maybe even ourselves, maybe this group. Dominica. Yeah, the next project is on. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks a lot for the remarks, uh, Scott. And I will just add a very few specific points in order not to repeat uh, anything that has already been mentioned. So on the public consultations, um, I tend to agree with uh, Stefania on the fact that um, we have, I think, been able to uh, we, meaning uh, key stakeholders across Europe, um, to mobilize in case there were some important pieces of legislation. Um, to give you an example, when DSA and the uh, European Democracy Action Plan were being negotiated, we felt like there was no uh, voice from Central and Eastern European NGOs and think tanks. So we got 16 NGOs and think tanks from Central and Eastern Europe together, and we contributed to public consultation. Um, and uh, another anecdotal evidence on the, on the contrary, I think that was the European uh, Media Freedom Act. Um, there was a case that actually the consultation has, um, the word has spread about uh, the existence of the consultation into a Slovak disinformation space, which is very vivid, very active. And so what happened at the end is uh, within the public consultations, you had dozens of contributions of angry people who were consuming disinformation about 
generally geopolitics, democracy, uh, the sources that are there are very much spread across Slovakia, which of course doesn't add to the representativeness of the, of the public consultation. It just puts more burden on, on the commission so that they have to sift through through these opinions of the citizens, which are, however, guided through uh, uh the, the 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 sources that that uh, are actually aiming to undermine uh, the eu and and uh, and its unity um on the question of uh, impact assessment and evaluations i completely agree with the fact that there needs to be more focus on uh, societal resilience on democracy i would also add that there needs to be more focus on security um we, I have also uh, looked at the better regulation toolbox. There is no mention of cybersecurity at all um, in, the, in, the, in the whole document. Um, as we, as the European Union is putting more and more focus on, on our own security, I think that the, re the legislation should be not only ex ante, but also exposed, evaluated through, through the lens of, of the security implications for the citizens, but also for, for, for the society and for the communities themselves. Um, yeah, and uh, I also think that the evaluations, we should put more emphasis on data-based evaluations. So you've mentioned a couple of examples about potential fatigue with the GDPR consent or um, its its impact in, in the sense of actually uh, citizens having less privacy because the, the, the consent forms are, are longer, but we don't know. We don't, I personally very much enjoy disallowing all the cookies and rejecting them. And I do it very diligent, the, diligently. And I also love using my phone and the, disallowing all the, all the, um, or activating all the protections. But I don't know whether I'm unique and the commission doesn't know whether I'm unique or this is a, um, this is an issue, uh, for, for across, across Europe. So I think we need more data based evaluations, uh, from this respect. Fantastic, Dominica. Thank you very much. A, potentially a further area of research. So look, we're we're coming towards the end and just a big chapeau to those online and here in, in person in Brussels for staying with us. It's been a, a, an excellent session, but we're now here an hour and a quarter. I have, there's only one theme left from my slate of themes that I wanted to discuss. Uh, they've all come up, but there's one I can put to the panel in a moment. But as before, I'd like to privilege the room first. Does anyone want to want to say anything, either by way of a question or a statement? Andre, we have the lady here to my right, stage right, first. And then if anyone else, please, uh, we'll do so afterwards. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Laureline Hoots from Microsoft. Thank you for a fascinating discussion and for uh, valid, very valid points from what I can hear. Um, I wanted to come it's been mentioned that we have seen uh, much more regulations and what you hear from companies, not only mine generally, and this is also a personal remark, by the way, um, is that it's not only the amount of regu regulations that or legislations that had increased, it's also like the there's sometimes off, quite often a lack of consistency and overlaps. And, and I wonder whether you have been thinking about uh, how to address that. You mentioned the one in, the one out. Uh, personally, uh, as I, I think about, I'm, like in Belgium and in many, most European uh, countries, we have like a, a codex, there have been codification uh, efforts on laws. And I wonder whether that would be potentially something that could help and force maybe the, the commission or the legislator to think about the consistency of the framework. Thank you. What was your first name again? Laureen. Laureen, lovely to have you. Now, that feels like a question for Scott. Was it a question for anyone in particular? Okay, I invite you in for a Seamus, then anyone else wants to come in. You first, Seamus. Uh, yeah, no, I might just go briefly and on over to Scott. Uh, definitely, I think it's a, it's a place that more could be done because we do see lots of regulations where there's either overlap or potential complications when they interact. Uh, including between the DSA, the DMA, the AI Act and the GDPR. Uh, there could be areas of overlap or areas of tension. What makes it more complicated, though, is when regulations are being developed simultaneously. I think this was part of the problem when it came to the DMA and the DSA and a little bit of the AI Act. There was an attempt to fix the problem for all three of them sometimes, and it can lead, that can lead to the situation being more complicated. Uh, so I think it is something that, that potentially does need to be addressed uh, and could be. Oh. Yep. So uh, I think you asked a very good question there. Um, there is a process in place called refit. You know, basically, if it's done correctly, it should mean that the commission periodically looks at measures, and they're not limited to looking at a single law. They could look at a cluster of laws and see, is there some way to consolidate or harmonize these into a more coherent body? 
not enough of it is being done, and I've written this elsewhere, but it, it, it's something that needs to happen. But there's a second point, and this one I would also like to emphasize, and that is we have different, what I would call thematic areas that are beginning to overlap in ways that they historically didn't. Uh, one of the most obvious is that privacy, which we're talking about today, now has a nexus to competition law. And of course, there's also a nexus to, to, to consumer protection. So a lot of laws that were implemented in silos today require a vision across the silos. Now, some member states have taken steps to at least enable the national regulatory authorities to converse with one another, to exchange with one another, to say, how should we do this in our member state? The UK has something for this. They're no longer a member state, but they're nonetheless an example of good practice in many areas. The Netherlands has put something like this in place, uh, largely modeled on the UK basis. Ireland, I think, also has something. Uh, several of the member states do this. At European level, we basically don't. Uh, you'll find a vestigial bit of it in Article 40 of the DMA, which has a high-level group where the different thematic areas can talk across to one another. Um, I would argue that far more is needed. I've also written this up in a paper. Um, and again, that I, I've trotted this out some parliamentarians who like the idea. It wasn't politically feasible to do something with it when I first came up with it. Maybe with the focus that we have on better regulation in the new commission and also with a fairly explicit mandate to Dombrovskis to... Uh, to, to make regulation more coherent, maybe the time has come to take a more serious look at this. And just a quick question to you, Scott, which I think you just answered in your your uh, the, the last remarks. You identified the quarter of auditors as having a potential responsibility in our previous discussion. Who will be responsible for this kind of codexing, the rationalization? Would it be the commission itself? Uh, I, I believe Dombrovskis, in his mission letter, has a very explicit charter to do some of the things that I had already been writing about for the last years. Um, his title actually is not only, you know, relates not to several things, but the last word in it is simplification. We never had a commissioner of, of simplification before. And I think also this needs to be understood, at least in part, as a response to the letter report and the Draghi report, both of which uh -huh. put fairly heavy emphasis on overregulation, on gold plating, not only at member state level, but also at European level. So in some ways, the, the, the time is right for this. And I think the perception that Europe needs to get its act together and try to reduce unnecessary burden. I'm not saying get rid of all regulation. I'm saying we need to do it better. The commissioner must be reading your stuff. Now, I want to invite Stefania and Dominica in, but Seamus, you're champing at the bit to, to come in again, are you? No, no, oh, just handling the mic that way. Stefania, you have anything, Dominica? That's perfect. Does, does anyone else in the room wish to, uh, to say anything? There's a question here at the front. Now we might have a chance for one more. Hello. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Ivana Frutov. I represent the English Bar here in Brussels and have done for many years. I'm also a member of the committee of the IAEA here in Brussels. So it's great to see you. Um, great to have you here. Great to have you here. <laughs> um, so I just, um, the, God, so many different things came up while you were talking. It's fascinating, and I'm going to look forward to reading the papers. Um, just in terms of, for example, legislation that's rushed through in emergency situations, an example that I was very much involved with back in the day, and I am going back in the day, was the European arrest warrant. And it's, a, it's one of those pieces of legislation that's been on the books now for more than 20 years. It still hasn't been revised. Um, it was uh, rushed through after the 9-11 attacks in the United States. The Commission was already working on the idea, and we were already talking uh, um, as experts on the, on the topic with members of the uh, DG Justice. It wasn't then DG Justice, doesn't matter. Um, uh, I, what I, I suppose what I want to say is sometimes, even in urgent situations, the resulting legislation actually works. It has loads and loads of problems, but nonetheless, it is still doing what it was meant to do. And one of the ways that the Commission has filled in the gaps over the years in it, and God knows it still needs revision, I'm not saying it doesn't, is by bringing in other pieces of legislation to flank it. And they have done that in that field. So, for example, the European Evidence Warrant, I mean, this is very specific to my field or one of my fields. But so I think that's one point. I, I would also say... Um, I, I, I 
completely agree with you. It would be wonderful if you could look at the impact assessment ex post facto and say, how does this compare? How does the resulting now agreed proposal compare with what we originally set out to do? I fear in practice that would be one hell of a politically complicated and logistically complicated exercise. Um, I agree it's a desirable thing to do. But I'm not. I'm. I remain to be convinced if you can do it. The other thing I would just like to say is I think it's great, if I may, that you are all not just identifying problems but trying to come up with solutions. It's really valuable. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and it's it's really good, good to have you here and good to meet you. Um, I think they're useful remarks. At least Scott would, would would like to respond. I just want to check: Does Stefania or Domenico wish to wish to come in? Let me see with Scott and then Seamus. Okay, sorry, I seem to always uh, like to shoot my mouth off on these things, but um, well, I, I, I agree that it's challenging. Uh, I think we could be doing more. Uh, I don't necessarily think we can get it perfect. But one thing that I think is underutilized in the current system is that every impact assessment, assessment is supposed to contain a few things toward the end. One is uh, impact on SMEs. Another is a section that says what sort of things need to be monitored. And um, here, I think, the real challenge is if we don't, at the time the law is enacted, if we don't arrange for the data to be collected that would be needed for a subsequent evaluation that looks at not just the direct effects of the law, not did this clause get, uh, get adhered to, but did it actually solve the problem that it was supposed to solve, or did it at least ameliorate it, mitigate it, help it? Uh, if we don't put that into the planning at the point when we're doing the impact assessment, we can't possibly fix it later. We can't even assess it later. Thanks, Scott. Seamus? Uh, just to come in on the point about urgency and making regulations during a period of urgency or crisis, perhaps. Uh, so I actually wrote a paper last year on the council regulation on Russian media, on censoring Russian media. And obviously, there could be potentially very good reasons that this is the type of measure you adopt in a crisis. I do think there is scope to have a different procedure for times of crisis or urgency, while simultaneously allowing for an impact assessment or a proper evaluation and study of it that proceeds simultaneously or at a certain date in the future that you can write into a regulation, this is being adopted in a crisis and therefore has to go through a more rigorous process of being scrutinized in six months time or in a year's time. And potentially you can even allow that to have a certain degree of flexibility in case the crisis persists. But I think there is definitely more that can be done to assess these regulations and do an impact assessment while regulation making in a crisis. Thanks very much. Anything else on this question panel? Then I'll just have a quick scan of the room if there's anyone else that would like to come in or say anything. Fantastic. Then beautifully on time, it brings me to the last part of the discussion. So as I said, I had a laundry list of topics, all of which came up. I have the advantage of having, of course, read and spent time with the paper. And this theme certainly did come up, but uh, I would like to give each of you an opportunity to say anything else. We'll start with Seamus and work up to, up to Stefania. Just a minute each, if there's anything you haven't said yet. But specifically, I'm interested to know about competitiveness. And it came up certainly in, Scott, in Scott's remarks. That competitiveness today feels like strategic autonomy of two years ago in that any meeting I attend, it, it tends to surface. Obviously, you have the Draghi report. And we have looking forward to the next five years of the Commission's work programme. So just dodge it if you have nothing to say, but in your closing remarks, if you have anything to say about how the improvement of regulation can uh, help to promote European competitiveness, I I'd appreciate your thoughts. Starting with you, Seamus. Uh, so there's some of the points already mentioned earlier about broader factors that we need to look at in competitiveness, not just costs and price competitiveness. And there is also the point about improving consultations to bring in more stakeholders because sometimes we only properly realize the economic consequences by doing that potentially. Uh, another point I might bring up here, uh, touching on some things that were mentioned, is in the impact assessments, uh, when they're looking at the implications for competitiveness, sometimes there's an assumption that harmonization across the EU will improve competitiveness just because of reducing administrative costs. And I think sometimes there's too much emphasis on that, and we're not taking into account the diversity of policies across the EU, which can have different business implications. And this is particularly true for SMEs. So in the impact assessments for the GDPR, for the DSA, for example, it was held that these would be of benefit to SMEs because of harmonization. 
Whereas in reality, SMEs are, are 99% of businesses, uh, but many of them are not able to benefit from harmonization to the same degree. So they can face new regulatory burdens and sometimes don't actually realize the benefits that impact assessments are saying that they will get. So focusing on SMEs a bit more in impact assessments and potentially differentiating between different types of SMEs, uh, I think would allow for a new, more nuanced approach. Thanks, Seamus. Dominic, if you have any final, final remarks, the mic goes left there, Seamus. And if you have any thoughts on competitiveness, no obligation for either. Yeah, it's not going to be on competitiveness, um, but uh, I just wanted to raise um, an issue that we uh, touched upon briefly. Um, I do believe that um, we should, uh, when looking at the regulations and the improvement of, of, of the better regulation toolbox or the processes, um, it sort of all the remarks that we have made um, point to the fact that there is still a siloed communication, siloed approach in terms of regulation making impact assessment and evaluation. So I think that there needs to be more of a um, whole EU approach where more um, DGs com and, and, and the commissioners would, would cooperate better and exchange information better. Um, I, uh, that's, that's one thing. Uh, the other is uh, also when it comes to the public consultations, I think that what we, where we could improve is to bring uh, more representativeness from different parts of Europe, uh, because as I mentioned, uh, from, uh, with, with regards to specific regulations, uh, we actually had to make an effort to mobilize um, to, to, to be able to contribute. So I think that geographical representation could be, could be secured in a way. Um, and um, yeah, more emphasis on, on security. Thank you very much, Scott. So th thanks to all for really, really great comments. Okay, I'd like to actually comment uh, on, on harmonization and also on productivity. Now, on, uh, for me, I actually like to distinguish between competitiveness and productivity because productivity is, I think, what we're really talking about. That's what Draghi was really talking about. That's a main contributor to competitiveness, but competitiveness drags in a bunch of other things. And here, um, relative to productivity, regulatory burden is clearly an issue, and the stakeholders think that it's an issue. Uh, there have been surveys from EIB, for example, for many years. And if you look at what I would think of as maybe the big three, lack of access to skills, lack of regulatory burden, and lack of access to finance, uh, what's come up pretty regularly in recent years is that uh, regulatory burden is number two, above lack of access to finance, which I would have thought of as being pretty huge. It is pretty huge. This says regulatory burden is perhaps even huger. And uh, that, I think, is a concern. Now, on the harmonization, I, I mean, I think this is also a point that's well taken. Harmonization is really hard. I co-authored a study of legal barriers to harmonization in the EU for the parliament a couple of years ago. There are just so many different things. We've been working on this for decades, 40 years maybe, and we still have gaps, and there will probably always be gaps because it's a genuinely hard problem. But we have to keep working on it because it's what the European Union is about. At, at the same time, not everything should be or can be harmonized. The Commission, in its various legislative efforts, tends to put a lot of weight on harmonization, on consistency, for a political economy and legal reason. And that is, the treaties basically say subsidiarity matters. That means things that can be done better in the member states should be done in the member states. So each EU, EU action has to somehow be justified in, on something in the treaties. And often, the easiest nail on which they can hang that garment is harmonization. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? And so it gets probably more attention than it deserves. There's some areas, if you look at the Draghi and Letter reports, both of them argue, well, telecommunications isn't harmonized across the EU. Well, that's right. It shouldn't be. Uh, local networks are local markets. If I want to buy a fixed network connection here in Belgium, I have to buy it from a Belgian company that, or from a company that has presence on my street, hopefully to my building. Uh, I can't expect a German company with no presence in Belgium to sell me a fixed network service. 
So the laws that were put in place rightly focus on harmonizing process, but also on adapting to local circumstances for competition, for infrastructure, for all the rest. And you know, there we've had 20 years of progressive refinement that worked, I would argue, pretty well, in fact. Um, but what it means is they're bounds to what we can do and should do in terms of harmonization. Stefani, if you could bring us home, please. Maybe just one sentence to conclude, because I agree with what's been said. That actually, normative framework of the EU empowers uh, European competitiveness, but not necessarily by empowering its SMEs, but just uh, being a factor that uh, discourages potential competitors from outside to join the race. Because if you look at the amount of uh, legal acts and normative frameworks you need to adhere to and to adjust to, it's a very significant pardon. Thank you very much, Dominica. We're at time and I only have three things to say. There's a thought, Ivana, was that your first name? Yeah, so just what Ivana was saying about being solutions driven. I was an academic for years before starting this role and not to put you off, Neil, I loved it, but I did often find myself dealing with problems and it's very refreshing to work in a job where you are focused on solutions. So I think the, if, if you have the time to look at our papers, you'll see that, that we do conclude with practical recommendations. And the ultimate point, just Dominica, you're making me think towards the end about diverse voices and hearing from different member states. It's probably the most rewarding part of this exercise. The fact that we all come from different places. We're looking at the same topics and themes, but uh, from our, our engagement together with the eight think tanks from different places, you're able to add in that really rich layer of context and the personal experience. So just to say, uh, certainly on behalf of myself, that it's uh, been a really rewarding part of this, of this exercise. Just a couple of thank yous. Thank you to all of you, both online, who've stuck it out and here in person as well. Uh, it's been uh, it's very appreciated for anyone to take any time of their day because everyone is busy, but to Spain, we're now five minutes over, my fault. But it's just appreciated you took the time to be with us. It's indicative of, I think, how important these discussions are. Thanks to our gracious hosts and SEPs, Andrea and Xavier on the... On the, tech, on the technology side, it's been really great working with you. And of course, just again, to acknowledge uh, Apple for their financial uh, support and indeed their just support in general for this exercise, without whom we wouldn't have been able to uh, have this meeting. So there are still teas and coffees downstairs. Please stick around if you can and do please read our papers. Thank you very much.